On behalf of the International Institute of Natural Wellness Education, I want to welcome you back to part two in our lecture on the water element as part of our five element um, theory series. So just in way of reminder, this is Dr. Hollist, Executive Director here at the Institute, and I do need to remind you that by proceeding, you agree to the following terms of use, including that all information and statements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration, are not intended to diagnose, prevent, treat, or cure any disease for informational purposes only, and by proceeding, you agree not to attempt to apply any principle or practice outlined herein unless you are otherwise licensed to do so. Visit us online at knowyourwellness.org. Uh, make sure as we make um, other videos freely available. Make sure you've subscribed on YouTube and liked us on Facebook. Now I want to make sure for those of you that are watching this um, uh, video freely available online, you're in essence ed uh, auditing this course, this um, lecture is part of our Master Herbology and Advanced Nutrition program. So I do want to remind you that um, there's, there may be things in here that are tied to other lectures and the real big thing that we need to make sure you're aware of is that you cannot um, contact us asking for medical advice, for health questions, for things of that nature. Our purpose in making these videos available is to give people an idea about the principles and things that are taught in our Master Herbology and Advanced Nutrition program. So we hope this encourages you to um, continue your education in natural wellness. Now let's jump right back into our lecture. If you have not um, watched part one, please stop this and go back and watch the part one of the water element. So as we jump back into five element theories, you've heard me say before, it is such a valuable um, and insightful tool. We use it in every area of our training here at the International Institute of Natural Wellness Education. And we're going to talk specifically up until um, now on part one, we've talked a lot about the dominant element, a lot about kind of what um, sets a water element dominant person apart. We remind you that everyone has all of these elements in them. So a lot of what we're going to talk about in part two isn't as related to the dominant element, but is simply um, tied to anyone that it has that element out of balance. Um, so to start with, I want to point out the two exceptions to that on this chart. One is right here. So this shape, as you remember with the other um, with the others, this is the face shape. And this is a very indicative face shape. I see this very dominantly in most of the dominant water element people. They have a very round, soft face, round eyes, sometimes even more than the face. The other um, point that I want to make sure you're aware of before we move on is this stress response. Um, this can be a very um, dominant indicator on, on someone's dominant element. So in the case of a water element, as we've talked so much about the personality of, a, of the water element, about someone's a dominant water element, we've talked about how they quiet and gentle, good listeners, they kind of like to be behind the scenes, but they're very involved with things. They just don't want to be in the spotlight. Well, as you can imagine, their stress response does not deviate from this. The stress response for a dominant water element is to internalize. Now anyone, if their water element was far enough out of balance when they got stressed, they could have that particular stress response. However, we see more commonly that people that are dominant water elements are going to have this internalized stress response. Now there's something I want to point out as we, as we look at all four of the um, stress responses. So up here for wood we see that the stress response is to explode, for fire it's to fall apart, and for earth it's to overreact. Then we come to the bottom of the chart and we see withdraw and internalize. Now there's a very uh, common misconception about stress response that the measure of the response indicates the level of stress that someone is feeling. If this has been your um, belief up until now, you really need to change that. The level of stress that someone's feeling, and what I mean by the level of stress is maybe a better way to put it is the amount of impact that a stressful circumstance is having on someone 
is not indicated by their reaction. So, and this is the perfect example, is if we see somebody explode or overreact or fall apart, we think, wow, they're really stressed. And that's true. If they're a dominant fire element and they got pushed stress-wise to the limit, that would be a common reaction is just to completely fall apart. Or for a wood element, they are going to explode. And, and people will see that anger and they'll say, wow, that person is really stressed. However, it is not a natural thing for people to recognize it when someone withdraws or internalizes. They sometimes instead say, oh, that person handles stress really well. Or, oh, they're, they're handling things really well. Especially, um, you see this in times of maybe of death or really serious, stressful, um, acute situations where you know there's a um, stress going on in the body. You know the autonomic nervous system is being impacted. But you see them internalize or withdraw. And people have this false assumption, well, it's probably not affecting them as much. Please understand that it just is, the only thing that tells you is what the, um, their dominant element could be. Because internalizing things has every bit the same um, reactions physiologically within the body, the same chemistry reactions, the same imbalance between the sympathetic and parasympathetic tones of the autonomic nervous system, the fight or flight response versus the relaxation response. All the same problems that we see as a result of stress, both the inability to process um, thought in the you know in, in the parts of the brain that are are effective for conscious and, and intuitive thinking and instead we see things moving to the limbic system instead of the the frontal lobes and so we start to see people react more than consciously make choices so all of the things that we worry about when someone's living in a stress state are every bit as real for someone that is internalizing or withdrawing that's just their reaction to stress. So be really clear on that. If, the, if they're a dominant element, you need to help them see, because they'll likely, somebody that's been a dominant water element, for example, their whole life, will likely have had a lot of people tell them, oh, you handle stress really well. They don't necessarily feel it, because they still feel the reactions of stress. They still may often have the physical imbalances that come as a result of the stress, and so you need to help them understand that internalizing is their natural stress response, but that doesn't mean it's better than the rest, and it doesn't mean it's okay to just internalize things. Just like somebody who's going to explode or fall apart, likewise, somebody that's going to internalize or withdraw needs to recognize it before they get to that stress trigger. And they need to do the things that are going to balance the system, which come back to this chart. The balancing reactions, the swimming, the meditation, water, um, not too much or too little, fluids, moderate love life. All the things that we've went through as we've talked about this in part one, they need to employ those skills and abilities along with the nutrients and herbs that we talk about in the lecture specifically on supplementing for element imbalance. So all of those things need to be employed in, in to prevent this internalization of stress or they will have the same physiological reactions that someone else did. So now that we've covered that, let's move on away from the dominant element perspective and let's talk about our color codes here. We have the key over here. The purple indicate things that when, they're, when this element's out of balance is a good indicator. So in this one, um, number 1, 2, 7, 13, and, and 14 are going to be indicators. The yellow we'll talk about at the end. The yellow elements are useful, but they can be taken both directions. So we have them yellow. You kind of need to um, pay attention to them and decide what they're meaning. And then green is good, useful things to balance this element. So let's start with that. Now the taste for the water element is going to be salty. Now most of you, even those of you that are that are auditing this course that have like that don't may not have a lot of natural medicine or nutrition training, a lot of people are aware that water 
um, balancing has to do with sodium. They've heard of people that um, that take sodium to help get rid of water, um, extra water in the body for conditions that end with, that deal with edema or things of that nature. So for a lot of you, that's going to be a natural process, and that's very true. Salty is the the taste or that your body uses to indicate what it needs to balance this water element. Now, as we go down the list, um, courage, this is the positive emotion, this number eight right here. And I really like this. You know, with every element, there's a, there's two emotions that we list on this chart. And we, you could say one's the balance, one's the imbalance, or two sides of the coin, however you want to look at that. The one that fascinates me more than any of them is the water element. Uh, you know, water element um, people are so phenomenal to me. Um, being a fire myself, water elements are um, dominant people are often quite an opposite from me. And so I have a lot of respect for some of the things that they ha are capable of. And, and this is one of those. Fear is the element that they can feel, or the emotion that they can feel real easily. When um, And then the other side of that is courage. What astounds me with water dominant people, and we all have this ability because we all have a water element, we just need to balance it more. But um, what amazes me is that when they're in a state of fear, they still have the ability to move forward with courage. And that's really a, an a awesome ability when that water element is in balance, that regardless of the amount of fear that we're feeling, we can move forward with courage. And I think it, it's no um, surprise that the water element deals heavily with the vital energy for our whole body. In Chinese medicine, the water element is where your vital energy, the vital essence comes into your body. And then that's the yin energy that nourishes the body. And then that's converted through um, the meridian vessel system into the yang um, or more masculine energy for the fire system. But the yin um, is really just phenomenal, this water energy. Okay, And so I, I just think it's really neat that, um, in that, that when that's in balance, that people in, in, st in those states of fear can still move forward with courage and it doesn't become debilitating because we live in a society that has a very common um, reaction to fear is not movement and it becomes very debilitating. Now let's talk about number nine here. Number nine is the time of year or the season. I, um, I want to remind you that it's not the time of year from what you're usually thinking of it. We need to look at this as what activities took place historically during that era. So it isn't it's less to do with, you know, the months of December and January. It's more to do with historically in an agrarian society what would have taken place in the winter months. Well, if you think about it, it would have been a lot of with um, activities that were um, you, you know, wrapped up in a blanket, it was cold. What is the, you know, um, water is everything to do with cold, fire is everything to do with hot. So it ties to the water element from the cold standpoint. And it ties from the water element from all of the things that we've talked about here. Behind the scenes, quiet, um, relaxed, uh, you know, meditative, spiritual centered, all of those things that we've discussed as we talked about this element would have been activities that took place in the winter time. So it's the, that's the activities that are going to be very balancing. That quiet time, wrapping up in a blanket. When people get too um, yin dominant, that's a real common thing we'll see. And we have a, um, you'll go through, in, as we go through the meridian vessel system, you'll go through a whole um, series on yin yang balancing. But the short thing that, you know, is one of the things we look for when somebody is very yin, when there's an imbalance and they're very yin dominant, is they're always cold, they're always wrapped up in a blanket, um, don't want to move a lot, they just want to, you know, pretend it's winter and stay in. And that can really be commonly from a yin imbalance. Storage ties in with that as well. This is the development. So number nine being the season, number 10 being the development cycle. Storing, not out growing and planting and harvesting, but rather storing it in, keeping the storehouse full, feeling confident that the storehouse is full, all really useful. Now, as we come down here, I want to spend a little more time on this idea of the water element. So we're just going to circle that as we have this discussion. So 
as we look at this, the organ systems that are associated with the water element, we've got the urinary bladder system, the kidneys, um, you know, the, which would be the renal system, the adrenal system. Um, for those that haven't been through extensive anatomy and physiology, the adrenals actually sit right over top of the kidneys. They're the added to the renal system. They're the endocrine gland um, that ties into this water element. All of the five element systems have an endocrine gland tied to them, and this, in this case it's the adrenal system. Now, water is, um, deals with everything in our body. And so the element, this number 12, as you remember, is what this element is responsible for metabolizing. So others you know, have fats and proteins and carbohydrates over here at Earth and minerals under metals. And then we come down here to um, water being under the water element. Now that's, um, in my opinion, the most common nutritional deficiency in America. There's uh, some things we need to understand in this process of water. So when I'm looking at balancing water, the, the common thing is we just, you know, if people are deficient in water, they need to drink more water, and that's true. The standard um, rule of thumb that we use is half of your body weight in ounces half your body weight in ounces. And so that's a real easy thing for people to figure. Um, there is other considerations that need to be taken into account if there's compromises to the renal system, if there's an uh, increase in physical activity. So there's ser several variables, but as a general rule of thumb, half your body weight in ounces is a very useful term. But as we look at the water system, what allows the body to be hydrated? Well, we already talked briefly about number five, salty. Sodium. So we know sodium, and, and a lot of people know potassium is the other side to that balancing act. Sodium and potassium. And so those are very key integral minerals for the process of hydration in the intra and extracellular fluid. But it, the reason to that is what's commonly not fully understood. Now, and that has to do with the pH of the body. We're only going to talk briefly because you go through a whole series um, on pH. But the, the thing that we don't always understand with pH is it stands for potential of hydrogen. And we think that if you take acids into the body, then you're more acidic. If you take alkaline things into the body, you're more alkaline. That's not entirely true. A good example of that is going to be something like fresh squeezed, you know, lemon water. Lemon being an acid, but it has a very alkalizing effect on the body. Because it's not as much the pH of the fluid going in as it is the nutrient reaction that allows for the potential of hydrogen in the intra and extracellular fluids, but specifically in the, the circulatory pathways of the body where that hydrogen is needed, the uh, molecular hydrogen. So we're dealing with what we call molecular hydrogen, not to be confused with the elemental hydrogen. And so when we start talking about the potential for hydrogen, another good example is people um, will use alkaline water. Now it's very useful and if you test the alkaline water it has a high pH. For those of you that are unfamiliar with that scale, the, um, the pH scale or potential for hydrogen scale, 7 would be a neutral pH. Okay, doesn't have any potential, it's neutral. Anything below that is going to be an, an acid or an, a more acidic. Anything above that is going to be alkaline. Now, the body is going to run anywhere from about, depending on which parts of the tissue you're referring to, we would like to see that run anywhere from 7.2 to 7.4. Now, the thing that's really uh, amazing is how strict your body keeps the arterial, there's certain, not all the tissues, but certain tissues of the body, your body keeps an extremely close eye on, where if it got up to something like 7.8, you would die, or down below 7. So there are certain things in Guten Physiology, which was is the common medical textbook in a lot of medical schools around the country, and one of their older additions to that, I haven't looked at their newest edition, but one of their older editions that I have, comments when it's talking about this, that the acid alkaline balance is one of the most phenomenal physiological reactions that takes place within the body. Your body does everything at all costs to make sure that potential for hydrogen is kept exactly where it needs to be. Now, why does this all tie to water? Well, you've heard me talk about potassium and sodium. Now, there's two other minerals that I want to acquaint you with, and the, that is calcium and magnesium. Now, the, these four 
together, sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium are known as the alkaline reserve minerals. This isn't coming from, um, from natural wellness, um, from herbology or naturopathy. That's from organic chemistry, that term. Okay, so the term alkaline reserve minerals is for sodium, potassium, calcium, and magnesium. All of those minerals have the ability to be used to change the potential for hydrogen within the the cells themselves and it goes back to that alkaline water so people drink this alkaline water that has a high pH you know a pH of you know 8 or 9 really good high pH however what sometimes people don't understand is the mechanism that made that high pH is a hydrogen reaction so the real reason that's having such an impact in the body is not just that you're drinking water that has a high alkaline level, but that the process to get that was this hydrogen reaction that makes a more available hydrogen for uh, molecular hydrogen for the body to actually utilize. Because that's the key. And it deals with enzymes and it's, it's a complex process that we'll talk. But the reason that's so critical is every mineral has a pH range that will allow it to be absorbed. So, water has a whole series of trace minerals that it needs to, and electrolytes that it needs to take place in order for proper hydration of water in the intra and extracellular fluids. And, if the pH range has, falled, uh, has fallen far outside of the parameters, many of those electrolytes and other minerals cannot be, uh, um, go through the uptake process. So when we're talking about water and balancing the water element or water within the body, we can't have that conversation unless we also remind you that the pH is very critical. And the specific four minerals that are key with that are going to be the alkaline reserve minerals of potassium, sodium, calcium, and magnesium. Now another interesting fact is magnesium and potassium are the two in those four that are very reactive to heat which is why we often have to especially supplement those. Potassium sodium balance is really important, but I, I don't remember the last time I put somebody on a sodium supplement. That's usually not a problem because the food, there's a lot of ways of getting sodium. It's the potassium that, that a lot of times their dietary choices don't make available. The same with calcium and magnesium. Oftentimes we have to supplement the, ma the, the magnesium as well. Now in the body, because it's such a critical process, this, um, this pH balancing to allow for all the mineral uptake and for the water transport across those cellular membranes that, that detoxifies the intracellular fluid and, the extra and allows the extracellular fluid to carry those toxins to the lymphatic system and out, you know, down through um, the Zipclavian trunks into the common bile duct and out through the body and get ri gets rid of them. All those phenomenal processes that the body does in order for that to happen, have to have this proper pH balancing. And since the body will keep that at all costs, the, con the most common minerals that I see that the body utilizes is calcium and magnesium. Magnesium notice being noticed primarily in the tissue, calcium being noticed in the bones. So a lot of our modern degenerative illnesses have a heavy component of um, acidity factors that have resulted in this degenerative illness. The pH balance is often very acidic, and so the body starts to literally cannibalize itself by pulling magnesium out of the tissue and calcium out of the bones, which is why we start to see common symptoms um, of legs being really twitchy and muscle cramps and pain in the legs and the, mu the larger muscles because of the magnesium lack. We also will see people have harder time healing with, um, with bone um, breaks or fractures, um, bone density, and they'll start to have bone loss. It's because the body itself is pulling out of the tissue and out of the bones, it's pulling the alkaline reserve minerals. So, to bring this all back into full circle, if this element is one that we're worried about, having, telling them to drink enough water is not enough. You also have to make sure that they are um, getting a, all a full spectrum of minerals, but especially the, ca the alkaline reserve minerals. And then, of course, we need to consider over here um, the metal air element that deals primarily with 
the um, absorption of minerals or the metabolism of minerals make sure everything's in balance there. So again, um, that's why we have to have a little quick talk on pH. All this will make sense. I ran through a lot of things there that I know are things you haven't um, fully understood. I, um, there, there are um, you know, some students that have already studied this, so I wanted to make sure it made sense to them. If some of the pH stuff didn't make sense to you, that's okay. It'll all come full circle as we give you the other lectures. Just remember those alkaline reserve minerals. Calcium, magnesium, potassium, and sodium are an important component for the process of hydration. If that's the only takeaway you have, that's fine. Um, start thinking of, about pH as an important factor in all chronic degenerative illnesses, in the absorption of all minerals, and the biological processes that take place in the body. So um, just start thinking of the importance of that and make sure you take that away. So as we continue, that kind of wraps up um, our greens, the things that we use to balance. So now let's talk about some of the indicators of a problem in the water element. Number one on the list is going to be the tissue. And wouldn't you know, based on just what we said, look at it, it's bone. Well, of course, we just explained to you why the water element, if the water's out of balance, there is likely a hydrogen or a potential for hydrogen or a, a lack of molecular hydrogen in the body in an effort to facilitate and to change that. It's going to pull from its alkaline reserve minerals and specifically right on out of the bones, calcium. So, and magnesium. So, really common when we have people that have a lot of bone density problems, bone problems, healing, you know, a lot of the things related to bone, we're going to look at the water element. Ears. So, we kind of shift gears off of the pH uh, soapbox for a minute. And as we talk about hearing, now this is a really fascinating one, the ears, because this is not just hearing um, physical ears. But also, when you, you notice somebody that, and sometimes they're aware of it, sometimes they're not, but people that have a hard time um, hearing, hearing others. Others can give them wise advice, and they just can't hear what other people are saying. They, they, they have an inability. That can often be a water element imbalance. So as we come back to this chart, and you remember as we talked about it being deficiency, recklessness ties into that. Um, fantasy. Others are telling them that things aren't balanced, but they almost are in a fantasy state. They don't hear others. Others are saying that's not a good idea, but they're acting recklessly because of the tie that the water element has to the ears. This is also common for people that have you know, actual hearing problems. Um, and we would look at the water element because that is the sense organ that's tied to that element. Now, as we go down the list here, we talked a little about fear already. Um, number 13, I, I don't need to talk a lot about. That's a fairly self-explanatory one. The urinary system, the renal system, is the water element. So when we see a big imbalance, somebody that's having um, problems in those elements, that's something we look at. Number 14, and a lot of the others is a really useful tool. One of the examples of that would be over here on the metal air element. Um, um, actually, what would be a better example? Probably the flesh up here um, or the nails up here on the wood. Those are really valuable ones. I want to caution you on head hair, number 14. Um, caution you away from when somebody um, is starting to lose head hair that you automatically assume it's water. There's actually a much more intricate connection that's causing that. It deals with the water element, but it deals with the adrenal system and the production of RT3, reverse triadothyronine, um, and that's that metabolism process that happens in the thyroid. So that's why it, some, this is one of the few that you might look at it and say, well, modern medicine would seem to contradict that because oftentimes in modern medicine, when they see loss of hair, they're going to look at thyroid function. Well, that isn't, they're not a contradiction. There's just a much more complex interaction that's going on within the endocrine system. And as you go through um, Professor Newsom's lectures on endocrine function, that'll become more clear to you. But just for right now, 
kind of be cautious with head hair and using it as an indicator. That's the you know traditional Chinese term, but just be cautious with it. You know, go ahead and cross that out for now until you understand that so full process. Now the last through is or last few as we're wrapping up here, the index finger is the finger associated with it. So um, fear, again, um, you could use that as a grounding mechanism when you're in a state of fear. You could hold your index finger with your other hand. So if it's um, a conscious fear, a physical fear, then you could do it with your dominant finger. If it's more of a, um, a fear but you're not sure where it's coming from, then you would want to hold the non-dominant finger. Um, so those would be ways, and again, we could talk at length on how to use that, but that's the finger for it. Psi is going to be the sound that is commonly produced. So oftentimes, you know, as you look at people that are dominant element, that's a real common thing for them to sigh. They're hardworking behind the scenes, and they may not say things, but they'll sigh. That's a common reaction with the water element. Cold, we've already talked about that. That's the, uh, the um, environment for this. And then the last two that I um, want to remind you are is number 15 and 16, really useful, but never, ever, 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 ever use them as a way to assess the imbalance of an element. But rather, if you know that element is out of balance, ask them if they're having um, any problems you know, in, in the sacrospinalis or so as a muscular system, and if so, recommend that they visit an appropriate uh, medical professional, be that a chiropractor, a massage therapist, um, an acupuncturist. If you're doing some of those techniques yourself with tuning forks or different things that you're able and licensed to do in your state, then you can go ahead and provide that service. But whatever the case may be, it's more of for you to help um, remind them that that may be a problem, but I never use those as an indicator of an out of balance, as you've heard me say before, because muscular skeletal problems as a result of injury and repetitive motion in our society is so common. So with that, we've went over a little more in this lecture than we normally do for part two, but I really needed you to understand this really intricate part process that deals with the potential for hydrogen and the alkaline reserve minerals and how important that is in water balancing. So um, with that, I want to thank you for your time and again promise you, I know sometimes when we go through these they seem overwhelming. Watch them, listen to them several times. As this, The more this becomes a part of you, the more understanding the intricate parts of these elements becomes a part of you, the, the more easily you will be able to work and interact with others, to recognize people's dominant elements and interacting with them in a way that suits them. It's really about learning to, to love and work with anybody in any circumstance, family members, co-workers, and clients that you'll have, it's really learning to see people for who they really are. And instead of trying to see them through your own eyes or your own glasses, try to understand their differences and celebrate those so that we can work together in a more of a, a harmony and love. So it's really a phenomenal tool, both for physical and emotional understanding. So please take the time, go through this one as many times as you need until you are very comfortable with it. Keep the chart handy and really work through that. So with that, I again, as always, thank you for your time. And on behalf of the International Institute of Natural Wellness Education, I remind you that wellness is your choice. Visit us online at knowyourwellness.org. Thank you.